Dr. Guyton will take a look at common problems with the retinoscopic reflex and will discuss what to do in each case. Here we are retinoscoping a patient without drops and suddenly the pupil constricts and the reflex changes. What happened? The patient looks directly at the retinoscope light. Redirect his attention to the end of the room. That's better. In this second patient, the reflex is changing spontaneously during the retinoscopy. The patient is either accommodating or relaxing his accommodation. This is especially likely to occur in children where distance fixation and fogging are not enough to control accommodation. Cycloplegia may be necessary in these cases. In this next patient, we suddenly notice the reflex spontaneously changing, but not from accommodation. Notice that it changes in brightness as well as in its movement. It often becomes whiter as well, but we cannot show that here. The patient is looking off to the side, and you are either retinoscoping nasal retina or the optic disc. Redirect his attention to the fixation target at the end of the room. That's better. What about irregular reflexes? In this young child with a dilated pupil, the central portion of the reflex has with movement, but the peripheral portion has against movement. This is spherical aberration, common in young eyes. This is easy enough to deal with. We simply neutralize the center of the reflex and ignore the myopic periphery. Spherical aberration is also present with nuclear sclerotic cataracts. But here, the center portion of the pupil is myopic. The central reflex shows against movement, and the periphery shows with movement. Here's the real problem reflex, scissors movement. There's nothing magical about scissors movement. It simply means that the different portions of the pupil have different refractive errors, sometimes differing by four or five diopters or more. It's impossible to neutralize the entire reflex, so we try to pay attention to the central portion. This is still difficult to do, though, and subjective refinement of the refraction is especially valuable in these cases if the patient is old enough. Eyes with marked scissors movement can often obtain good visual acuity, indicating that only a portion of the pupil is used and that the stray light through the other portions of the pupil is effectively ignored. Because we cannot predict which portion of the pupil the patient uses, though, subjective refinement is particularly important with irregular astigmatism such as this. Here's a case of gross irregular astigmatism caused by keratoconus. The irregularity is so great that a dark space often appears in the center of the reflex. Most of these patients will require a contact lens to cover the irregular cornea. A different problem occurs with small pupils. The pupil is so small that the edges of the reflex are hard to see. The best trick here is to move closer, at least temporarily, to see the reflex better. Sometimes, even with a large pupil, the reflex is dim and indistinct. The first thing to think of here is a high refractive error, for the reflex in high refractive errors always appears dim at first. Crank in large amounts of plus or minus sphere to try to improve the reflex, like so, and then continue to neutralize the reflex. If the dim reflex is not improved with high plus or high minus sphere, suspect a cataract or other cause of cloudy media. Try to move in closer to get a brighter reflex or use one of the new retinoscopes with a bright halogen bulb. Those are most of the problems you'll encounter with the retinoscopic reflex. This concludes our program on retinoscopy. By practicing first with a model eye and then with patients, as we have demonstrated here, you should soon be able to perform retinoscopy with ease. Reviewing this program from time to time during the learning process should help especially in polishing your retinoscopic refinement techniques and in recognizing and in dealing with problem reflexes. Remember, Jack Copeland is watching over you. Good luck.